It's three words, healthy equals growth. And we've been very simple in the word the last few weeks. We dealt with last Sunday, the disciples' prayer, our Father which art in heaven. The midweek service, we dealt with Psalm 23, which is, is this is 2023. So we dealt with uh, that popular psalm, and we broke it down because many times we repeat them so much, we don't even know what we're saying. You know, when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you, we don't even understand what we're saying about it. So we went back and took care of that. And today, again, uh, simplifying it. As we move toward the year, I don't like complicated church. I don't like condescending preachers. I like to be able to help you understand. Because when I got born again, I didn't know hardly anything about the church. Didn't understand brother, sister. I didn't understand uh, the catching away of the church, Jesus coming again. Didn't even understand who Jesus was, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Or which one do you love the most? I didn't understand any of that. Uh, just trying to walk through things, you know. So I look at when I'm, even though I'm 61, I've been preaching now for over 40 years. I look at people when they come into church and realize not everybody has had this uh, gospel experience or uh, education like I've educated myself. So I want to help you and walk along. So as I walk through this, Acts chapter 2, verse 42, read the whole book of Acts 2 last night, the chapter this morning, and uh, found it delightful. It's the beginning of the church. It's the day of Pentecost. Uh, great things are happening. The, the Spirit of the Lord blows into the place. Rex, Rex, a festival, if you would. People began to speak in other, the tongues of the people. So whatever people had gathered there, it was a melting pot of different cultures and nationalities. People were speaking in their tongue, and it shocked them. And they knew then it was a God thing that took place. And then the Scripture talks about 3,000 people at one time got added. And I can tell you this. The churches in Crosby in Northeast Harris County, amen, and, and uh, South Montgomery, they, they're not ready to handle an influx of that. You know, we always talk about revival. We say, well, we got plenty of room. We don't have the room if God decided to move on to people and fill the house. And then you would have to become the disciplers because disciples disciple. So you, I mean, it would put a demand on the people of this house if we ever got to this place where God decided, okay, I think today I'm going to throw 3,000 new people into the churches. Hallelujah. How would you be able to handle it? They'd come in with all different cultures and attitudes and colors, and, and you'd have to deal with it. I'm excited about a movie coming out. I hope it depicts what I believe in. I got saved in November the 10th, 1979, at the tail end of what is called the Jesus Revolution. It was a hippie movement that took place in the church of God. It tripped everybody out. You know, Kirk was a part of that back in the day, and, and a lot of the... the mainline churches were there. And I think one of my favorite actors, Kelsey Grammer, I love Frazier. Just can't get enough little Eddie. You know, I just, I just, the whole show cracks me up. But he's the preacher in the show, and it's a very uh, 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 southern type church. And these hippies get saved and come in the church and mess everything up. And what you may not realize, in the late 60s, early 70s, when this uh, hippie movement was going on, God interrupted it just like he did the book of Acts chapter 2, and the Jesus movement started. And men like Keith Green and Larry Norman and Randy Stonehill, uh, 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 the, the Rez Band, uh, groups that I cut my teeth on, it was known as contemporary Christian music. It wasn't even there. All you had then was the uh, singing statesman or the Kingsman or some quartet. That's all you got, Kenny, back then. But all of a sudden, these rock guitars and, and drums and synthesizers came to the church, and the church world didn't know how to handle it. The world was not the enemy of the Jesus movement. The church was. The, the traditional church didn't know how to handle it. So how could we as a church handle a move of God that would take place and just throw in a whole bunch of good billies? I mean, remember last week, amen, yeah, he'll Billy, amen. So what would happen if God started throwing in all these hippies and, and different people started coming? It, it, would, it would shock some of us. Some in that, in that show, I saw where some were getting up and walking out of church because they couldn't handle it. I pray that God would expand our thinking and realize the grace of God is to all people. Amen. That would be my hope and my prayer. So here's the thing, guys. We got to understand that our founder, we have a founder. This church had a founder. His name is not Jerry. Amen. The founder of the church, the living church, is the resurrected Jesus. Amen. He's the founder of our church. He's the one that founded it and got it started. Uh, he, he did it with his own blood, started that thing rolling. The church hit. The church will never cease being the church. It'll always be the church, man. Amen. I, I heard a song this week, again, on a contemporary station about... Um, 
Sunday sermons, and it had to do with the church. You can't, you can take me out of the church, but you'll never get the church out of me. Amen. I'll always be churchy. There's something about, I love the church, man. I love the fellowship in the church. I love everything about the church. And then this founder had a goal in mind, amen, to change individuals' lives, to bring regeneration within their hearts. I, I believe that almost every Sunday when a lot of folk lift their hand, they're asking to uh, be restored. We talked about that on the midweek service. Be restored. But the bottom line is your spirit is right with God whenever you get regenerated. When you ask God to come into your life. You get born again is the word. So God's desire is to change you. Now, I don't care how much you like you. There's somebody in this room hoping God changes you. And the one that should hope the most is actually you. You should ask God, change me. I'm not the way I ought to be. There ought to be a difference in me, amen, in my language, in my thinking, in my life, amen. So let a change take place in my life. That's being born again. And sometimes, you know, I mentioned this last week that, uh, Pastor, if I smoke dope, uh, do I have to give it up to get saved? No. Well, I, I drink a lot. Do I have to quit drinking to get saved? No. Well, I cuss a lot. Do I have to give it up to get saved? No. You don't get clean before you take a shower you're taking a shower to get clean and when you submit yourself under the power and the blood of jesus he will start cleaning you up and nobody will have to tell you exactly what you got to do you'll figure this thing out you'll work out your own salvation with fear and trembling You'll figure out that you've got to do the right thing here. See, a lot of folk, and I, this was that kind of mentality when I was back in Alabama, was that you had to get a suit, you had to get cleaned up, and you had to get right before you went to church. I thank God I went to church before I was ever right. Amen. Then God started cleaning me up. And it's a process. Everybody say process. Justified means just as if I never seen him. When I get born again, just, I mean, God wipes my slate clean. But then this sanctification is my mind, my soul. We talked about on the midweek, my soul. It takes time to clean that up. And just when you think that you got that dead man dead, sometime he wants to resurrect. He does it in traffic. So you got to beware. He does it during a, a meeting with, with family. Don't look around. Amen. So the goal is God wants to change us. He wants to have a regeneration with inside of us that there's something that takes place. His method has always been salvation. He's never had any other method. He didn't change it because it might not have been working for a couple of hundred years for anyone else. When God decided he wants to change something, it's salvation. That's why we use the word save. Jesus saves. Amen. He, he rescues us. He redeems us. So salvation, this is not political. You don't have to be a Republican to get saved. God help the Democrats. Amen. You ain't got to be a Democrat or an independent. It has nothing to do with that. Education. The wisest or the, uh, and I'll be nice, the unwise can get saved. Matter of fact, the Bible called Peter and the disciples uh, uh, unlearned men, uneducated and unlearned. So education doesn't stop me from becoming born again. Amen. It, do, it doesn't shift that. Or religious philosophy, whatever you thought before you got born again, that affects a person from without. But an act of divine redemption made possible through the blood of Jesus, which affects every area of a believer's life. It's the blood plus nothing. It's what he did at the cross that saves us. It's not your works. It's not water baptism. It's not speaking in tongues. It's, not, it's the blood plus nothing. All that's extra, but it's the blood. It's what he did at the cross. And we don't diminish that or, or put it down by saying, I can do anything else to get saved. It's by his name and the blood. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. So it's important. His means is through discipleship. He uses committed, consecrated, dedicated believers to carry out his plan. Committed practitioners of the faith. You practice this seven days a week. You don't just lay it down with someone you showed up on Sunday and you walk out the door. You got to practice this faith. You got to keep going. It's your faith that the devil wants. It's your faith that the world don't understand. Jesus told Peter, he said, I prayed for you that Satan can't take your faith from you. Amen. Your faith is so important, what you believe and what you hold on to be true. So Acts chapter 2, are you comfortable? Verse 42. Y'all thought you was going to get away, didn't you? <laughs> then they that gladly received his word were baptized, 
And the same day, 3,000 were added to the church. And they continued in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread. Mm, that's, fellow, that's communion, that's eating together, and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul. You remember I told you, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Let me back up on the word fear. That's good fear. When you have the fear of God, that's good fear. Fear of man is, it holds a snare, paralyzes you. Fear of stuff holds a snare and paralyzes you. Fear of God is good for you. Fear of God will make you risk. Think on that. Hmm, that's good. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles, and all that believed were together and had all things common. And these guys actually sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every person had need. And they continually, daily, with one accord in the temple. Now, they were having church all the time. And breaking bread from house to house, and did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And God kept adding, the Lord kept adding to the church daily as such should be saved. So God knows how many should be saved and kept adding to it. Father, thank you for your word. Let your anointing fall on my lips. Lord, let our hearts hear that those that are watching online reach and grab hold of this. Let an anointing flow from here to end their homes in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. You, God, you may be seated. Uh, I'm going to walk through these real fast and we'll tell you what they mean. Churches grow warmer through fellowship. Churches grow warmer through fellowship. They grow deeper through discipleship. When we disciple, when we learn from each other. Remember those 12 disciples, which became 11, then another one was added after Judas' death, but they became apostles. Amen. And uh, we've talked about apostles and having the ability to open and close, to gather in, gather out, raise up, tear down, things like that, the apostle. Churches grow stronger through worship. Our worship in this house speaks of the strength we have in this church. If we're going to be a healthy church, we've got to all get in on worship. Amen. And worship is not how loud you can sing. Amen. Worship is a sincere heart toward God. Amen. It, it is a part of it's singing and clapping and dancing and all those things. But it just needs to be real. It needs to be from your heart. And sometimes I have to do it to remind my heart, let's get this thing rolling. Amen. So I'll come in. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll dance the best I can, but I've never been really good at the honky hop. But I, I do what I can. Churches grow broader through ministry. All our ministries that are a part of this church, that's how we grow. Amen. That's our footprint, how we move out. And churches grow larger through evangelism. It's not the pastor's job to win people to Jesus, though it's one thing your pastor loves to do. But I believe everybody here should win somebody to Jesus. Amen. Everybody here should be after that. And it doesn't mean you have to be mean, corral them, or, or but, uh, butcher, or, 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 or <clears throat> bully. Bully's a good word. I was thinking of the word uh, henpeck. You know, sister, don't henpeck him. Mm-mm. Because some of that look like buzzard bitten. Just, just to back off, give God a little time. Somebody even asked me uh, this week, said, Pastor, uh, my husband, he's not a tither. I, I believe in tithing, though, and, and uh, I have a job, and I tithe off of it, and it, sometimes he gives me money. Should I tithe off the money he gives me? I said, no. Don't you do it. Amen. I don't want uh, problems in your family. You keep tithing. You keep believing God until he starts figuring this thing out. Amen. When he figures it out, he'll realize what a blessing it is to be able to be a giver and a receiver. Amen. If the church is to grow, we have to become warmer through fellowship. We got to. We got, we can't, got to stop spitting icicles at one another and, 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 and walking around like porcupines. You can't even hug them because you feel like you can get stuck with them. You know, you, you know we, we've got to grow warmer. We've got, we got neighbors. Everybody here got neighbors. Some of you live in subdivisions. Some of you have a lot of friends. But we got to start reaching out and connecting with people. It says they continued in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Fellowship is literally defined as two, two fellows in the same ship going the same direction. Amen. That's all it is to it. And by the way, they're fishing in there. So that, that's another part of it. They, they visited together around the table, which is breaking of bread. They visited together in the church. There was power in gathering for the purpose of mingling. I love coming to church and listening to the church talk. Uh, we were back in the back room so Wednesday, uh, Tuesday night, and some folk came in the front door, and they realized these doors were closed. They said, where is everybody? I said, just listen. You could hear it coming down the hall. 
People were fellowshipping back then. They were they were mingling with one another. They were talking, and I didn't want to stop it. Both whenever this happens in our churches, I love it because this is people getting to know each other and connect with one another. They visited together at each other's homes. Hospitality, enjoying having people. You gotta learn, you gotta learn how to let folk come into your home. Amen. I, I, you know, our home's been remodeled since uh, two floods. And I told uh, Sister Roy, I said, we got to start inviting folk into this house. It's a pretty house for just us. We've made it bigger. And we, sure enough, we started doing that. We started inviting more people in. This week, I have visited several shut-ins. And I have had the best time. The best time. Meeting in people. And one of the great things about you, and I would encourage you to call people before you show up. But I don't. I'll take a risk driving 40 minutes that they're going to be there when I show up. And I stood in front of a door this week, and that man saw me, and he said, come on in here, Pastor. I've known his family since uh, the early 80s. Won't mention that name, but I sat down with him. They're unable to come to church. His, his health is declining some. And, and we laughed, and we cried, and we spent time together. And I thought, what a blessing just to be able to go into somebody's home. And he said, Pastor, I've been watching live stream. So now, Dennis, I tell you, this thing's worth every penny we've paid for it. Amen. For people to be able to watch all around the country and those that are shut in and you say well it'll never happen to me you don't know what's going to happen to you and if you're traveling you're on the road to be able to get this service and pick it up again and to feel at home you know and to know that there are people that are praying for you and that's a part of your family so we got to grow warmer through fellowship this year i'm saying this in the beginning of january because our genesis will determine our how we start is important so to fellowship to hang out to get to do things together not just at the house of god but to, together listen church listen to this phrase write it down if you haven't already you are not functional until you're relational you can tell me all day long about revelation how one, how you know the bible and all this other stuff but if you ain't functional excuse me if you ain't relational with people if you ain't learn how to connect with folk then what you know don't matter same way in business. If, if you, can, you, can, you think you're functional, but if, you don't, if you're not relational with people, nobody wants your business. Nobody wants to connect with you. So it's important to have relationship because it's the currency of the kingdom. Amen. It's how we react to one another. So it's important for us to become more relational. How do we do that? Well, we got to relate. Can I get an amen? See, I, I, I've learned to relate on so many different levels. I, I, I ride a Harley. I drive a hot rod. I, I, I've been a, cow, a little bit of a cowboy before. I can relate to a lot of little things, a little bit of a mechanic, not great, but a little bit of stuff. I, I can play ping pong if I have to, amen. But, but to learn to relate to people means that whatever I got to do, I, I can shoot a gun, I can go deer hunt, whatever I got to do to relate. I'm not great at any of those, but I can relate to people. And many times, we, we've not learned how to relate to folk. We ain't learned how to connect with them. Amen. Very few pe folk uh, that I ain't been around that I can't connect with. So it's important you become relational with folk. Now, I'm not boasting about myself. I'm just saying I learned a long time ago, he that wins souls is wise. And to be wise, i got to be relational. Amen. All right. Next one. If the church is to grow, it's got to grow through discipleship, which means you need to take somebody. I, I, I really appreciate Pastor Joseph's um, system ministry and what he does with uh, not just the youth but he gathers disciples around him he's learned this secret of connecting he calls it what 531 531 uh and what's that mean connect with five people disciple three like jesus did peter james john peter and jj invest in one and and i've heard 531 i've heard 12 my friend, Pastor Gary McIntosh, did a, a system of 12. He took 12 men under his wing, discipled them, and had those 12 get 12. Now that church is around 5,000 people. So it's amazing that if we decided, okay, we're going to, sisters, we're going to start really discipling some people. We're going to get one to invest into and three. And, and I, I, you know, I've read Jesus had 70 disciples at one time. Then he had 12 that, that he ran with. But you know that every time Jesus went somewhere of importance, who did he take with him? Pete and JJ. He always had these three with him. 
to Jairus' house is Pete and JJ. Mount Transfiguration took Peter. Amen. Uh, he always had these guys. These three guys were always hanging out with him. When he went to Gethsemane, it was Pete and JJ that were there. It wasn't all the other disciples. Not everybody can go where you're going. And when you understand that, you realize that you've got to gather some folk around you. Amen. Start pouring into their lives. Uh, so both new believers and newcomers need to find their purpose in life. We all have a, a hidden gift. I love the Scripture, 2 Corinthians 4, 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. The message says it this way. If you only look at, at us, you might well miss the brightness. We carry this precious message around in unadorned clay pots of our ordinary lives that to prevent anyone from confusing God's incomparable power with us. In other words, it ain't about us. We're clay pots. Let me break it down a little more. We crack pots. Uh-huh. We're made out of dirt. we dirt bags. Can I get an Amen. We came from the dirt. That's what God uses. And he takes these clay pots and he puts his Christ in us, the hope of glory. Hallelujah. That he's inside of us so that everybody would know this ain't about us. This is Jesus. Man, I'm going to tell you something. I saw the most miraculous thing Monday night in football when a young boy collapses on the, on the field. A man had a heart attack, died. They brought him back. And I saw an NFL that said, you can't pray. You can't kneel to Jesus. You can't do this, that, and the other. Next thing I know, grown men were weeping and crying and calling out to Jesus. Touch my friend. Hey, it changed the whole. They, I I mean, uh, uh, them prognosticators up there in the, in the booth were praying. People didn't know what else to do but pray. As long, listen to me, you will never legislate prayer out of our lives. We will always have prayer in school, in the government, amen, in our businesses, in our churches. Whatever there's a need, folk going to cry out to God. And I'm glad to hear that young boy surviving and kicking back. And, and I love the fact, Kenny, when he woke up, the first thing he asked was, who won the game? That's, that's my kind of spirit right there, amen, that, that, that football desire. You know, somebody said, well, football, well, of course it's dangerous. Riding a Harley's dangerous. Being out there in the traffic, dangerous. Amen. It's just, it's, life is dangerous. So I, I ain't saying shut down football over it. You can't make it any safer, quote, unquote. Keep going, preacher. Okay. People blossom when they find their ministry gift. When you find what it is God wants you to do, I don't care if it's greeting at the door working with the children, amen, I don't care if it's parking a car, coming in here and singing, getting up here in the prayer. You, you say, well, we've got a prayer team. If you like to pray, get up here with, 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 with these brothers and sisters and pray. Amen. You ain't got to sit back there. You say, well, I got a little anointing for prayer. God, God used me. Well, get up here and pray with us. Amen. You ain't got to back away from that. Well, so when you find your gift, it's a powerful thing. A disciple is more than a believer. It, it involves consecration, and no one can produce a disciple who's not a disciple himself. We begot what we are. So if you've been discipled, then you're able to disciple. That's why Pastor Joseph can do it, because he's walked through discipleship his own self and still learning. So you've heard me say for years, we're believers at first. And let me just say, I love this phrase, always have H, fellowship with believers. I mean, it's been a coin for mine. I've backed away from it for certain reasons, but it's, it's a, it's a phrase that, that in my, it's been in my heart, a fellowship of believers. We start out as a fellowship of believers. Amen. We're not, we're not disciples. We're not Christian. We're just a fellowship of believers in Christ who are being discipled to be Christian, to be like Christ. Amen. So I, I love that because even the Scripture lays that out Cause because he becomes lordship. If he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. Listen to me, and i got to move quick. you got a lot to cover today. Luke 9, 23, he said to them all, if anyone will come after me, he got to deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. We're going to talk about discipleship. That's why I'm saying as a believer, you can stay a believer a long time still get to heaven. But you want to do what God calls you to do, you become discipled. You start discipling because that's what he asks us to do. To disciple, it gives you strength. You're not stumbling like you've always done before. Amen. So first he said, deny yourself. It's made up of the deepest level of one's will to say no to something. Before this service is over, I'm going to ask you if you wouldn't mind fasting with the rest of us for the next 21 days. Amen. It's just saying no to yourself. It's not making, um, it's not that I want more of God. I want God to have more of me. I want him to have more of me. 
Amen. So this is what we do. It's to make him the ruling passion of your life. To take up your cross daily. It's a dedication to him. What Jesus was saying, if you want to be my disciple spiritually, you've got to die to yourself. You must prefer my will to yours. Give up what you want to do in this life and allow me to be your focus. In saying that, that doesn't mean that God takes the pleasures of joy away from you. You'll find out a lot of the desires you have in your heart, God already gave it to you. He gives you the desires of your heart. Amen. So a lot of the things that we want to do in life, God already put a passion in it for us to do. Amen. He's not going to try to take it away. Third, he says, follow me. At the heart of this is the thought of obedience. Just follow him. 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, Paul says, and the things you have heard me say, and, the, and again, Timothy was one of his disciples. Amen. You've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust it to reliable men who will also be able to qualify to teach others. They didn't have text messages, didn't have the internet, didn't have live stream. They had one another. So they would share with one another, amen, what gospel they had. You understand in Acts chapter 2, uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, uh, Colossians, they hadn't been written yet. The book of Revelation has not been written yet. They just had a little bit of the gospel that they knew. And so they took what little they knew and they began to share it with one another, amen, and connect with one another. So the church grew from this. Paul shared it with Timothy, Timothy to faithful men who taught others. Randy and Bubba helped teach me, and I've been teaching others. Amen. That's how life works. And a lot of the others have been teaching others. I hear other people say, you know, Pastor, I find myself quoting you. I'll hear somebody say something and say, that sounds like Pastor. Amen. Well, you need to understand something. I stole it from somebody too. I just can't remember who it is at my age right now. Amen. So I guess it's mine now. Hello. Hallelujah. So the church grew that way. Matthew 5, 16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Listen, so here's this thing. We get saved and we call it freedom. Freedom. We free. We free. We free in Jesus. We free. Listen, freedom, unless it is restrained, does not become power. Freedom got to be restricted. I've raised horses. We've birthed horses out there on that property, Kenny. Kenny, I think you gave me some really foul horses before. Do you remember that? Stubborn, cantankerous, and, and they, they were free when they got out there on that property. They ran all over the place on that property. But if I ever wanted to use that freedom, we had to restrict them. We had to help them understand. We put them in a round pen, and we worked them. Until they ran left and right and left and right, and it came to us nose to nose. Amen. Threw a saddle on them, let them buck and jerk and buck and jerk until we was able to get on top of it. We restricted their power and put a bridle on it, just like you would the Great Niagara Falls that's giving power out to the uh, northeast over there. You had to restrict it. In our lives, sometimes we got to restrict our freedom. we got to say, we got the freedom to do. Paul said it all the time. I have freedom to do a lot of stuff. But I have to limit my liberty. Write this down. i got to limit my liberty by my love. If I love you, I ain't going to do that in front of you. Amen. I have a lot of liberty in life. i got friends that have liberty to, to uh, sip a little bit. Y'all know what I'm talking about? They, they sippers, sipping saints. Y'all know what I'm talking about out there? You don't look around. Just look at me. Amen. They got liberty to do that. I don't. I don't. Uh, Natalia came in the house yesterday, and she talked about uh, she in her culture, as a, as a young uh, believer in the Russian community, she wasn't allowed to drink. So it's strange to her to drink. So I would never uh, pop a drink in front of her, pop open a Miller. I hated Budweiser. Uh, pop open a Miller in front of her because she. But the bottom line is, I told her my culture, I don't drink either. I ain't drank forty something years. Amen. But I don't beat people up over it. Amen. You want, uh, man, they, they, them German believers over there, glory to God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Them Germans all about the pot over there, you know, and they, they sat around. Martin Luther was a, was a, was a drinker, you know, and, and uh, what's his name? Uh, Charles Spurgeon was a, a, a smoked cigars, big cigars. Some of the greatest preachers you ever heard smoking cigars. Uh, but John West, uh, I mean, who was it? Uh, one, of the, one of the preachers, I think it was Spurgeon, came over to visit Charles Finney. I, I get it mixed up. But they looked at him, and one of them was kind of portly, one of the preachers, and he went over to see uh, Charles Spurgeon. He knocked on the door of the English preacher, and, he, and Spurgeon showed up with a big cigar. And he says, why, Charles, you smoke? And he looked at the guy, and he says, well, whatever his name, you're fat. 
Hey, Amen. You hear me? So we got to learn to limit your liberty by your love. Hey, Amen. What? You got to restrict your freedom. That's what fasting, I'm restricting my freedom that I can do because I want more power in my life. So let's keep moving, preacher. Okay. If the church is to grow, it's going to grow stronger through worship. We talk about it. The Scripture tells us to enter God's presence. I'll enter His gates with thanksgiving. When we come into church, our worship is designed according to the Scripture. Our first few songs are always at upbeat. Amen. We're giving God thanks. And then we're going to finish with a worship song. Then we finish with worship. That's why we do what we do. That's why we've always taught it. We encounter God's presence behind the veil, if you would. We experience his provision at the mercy seat. He forgives us. Come boldly to the throne of God that you might receive forgiveness. Amen. That's what we find it in worship. You know, roots here, receiving his word in our hearts and seeing his works in our lives. You're never going to get the church out of people once the church gets in you. Amen. That's what God does. So worship is an outward expression of an inward love. Don't tell me you love God and you can't express yourself. You got to express yourself. Well, I've been, I'm married. Okay. I'm sure she'd appreciate you expressing yourself. Can I get an amen? Amen. Expression is a wonderful thing. I, I'm going to tell you, I, I watch a little football. I get excited. Tomorrow night, Georgia. The team here out of Texas going to play for the Natty. And uh, when they do, I'll get excited. Amen. I'll shout, but I promise you, I won't shout anymore Monday night than I did here today. Amen. My big shouts come here. Amen. If the church is to grow, it's going to grow broader through ministry. Uh, Jesus said, now he just a teenager when he said this. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You know what Jesus was actually saying? As I, as I am here on this earth, I see people that are oppressed. I see people that are blind. I see people that are poor. I see people that are bound with addiction. Amen. And I came to set them free. That's why I'm here. And I believe that's the ministry of the church. Amen. Is to see people in, in a condition and for you to remember, you were bound in addiction. You were bound in poverty. Amen. You were bound in spiritual blindness. Your life had, was bound up in so many ways, but the Spirit of the Lord is now upon you. The Message Bible says it like this. God's Spirit's on me. He chose me to preach the message of good news to the poor. He sent me to announce pardon to prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, to set the burdened and the battered free, to announce this is God's year to act. 2023 got to be God's year to act. Can I get an amen? Amen. If the church is to grow, it's got to be because of the evangelism. Amen. To reach out. And I know this is kind of be a difficult word. So we got the Mormons running around on bicycles witnessing the people. You got the JWs knocking on your door trying to give you a watchtower. You got all these different, and then all of a sudden we get kind of bundled with them. But my life and your life to win people to Jesus has to be first, you know, if first they got to see it, and then you can say it. And you share with them about what's going on in your life. And there's always going to be a need like that young man that, that died on the football field Monday where people are going to say, we need prayer. Amen. And you're going to have an opportunity to pray with them. And sharing with people, and sometimes it's a gradual thing. Sometimes folks just kind of fall into it. They'll start coming to your church or whatever, and then they, they give their lives to Jesus. So other times, it's a radical born-again moment because they've hurt so much. They've learned enough. Amen. They, they want that. I just, I just need Jesus. I realize this. I can't get to heaven without Jesus. Amen. So I, I, want, I want all the Jesus I can get. So to grow, we got to ask ourselves this one question. And this was the question. When I went to Bible college in 1982, the question was this. Do you believe people are going to hell? That's a mic drop right there. Because you got to answer that question. Do you believe that people that do not know Jesus are going to hell, a devil's hell? Because if you don't, then you really don't even need to be in this church. If you don't, then why did you even give your life to Jesus? If you don't, why are you struggling and fighting over your conscience right now? If you don't. See, I do. I believe that people need to know that first there is a heaven, amen, to go to. I'm not always concerned about hell, but I believe there's a hell. I've often called hell a forgotten place for forgotten people who forgot. It's a forgotten place. We forgot hell exists. It's not only the heat so, uh, uh, so strong that the body will not eat. This body that you have will not even burn up. The worms will crawl in and out of your body. 
Amen. It'll be a place of, of separation where you won't even be able to see your friends and your family anymore. It, I mean, when I think of hell, it makes me want to say, man, I need to reach more people and I need to watch myself. Amen. This, this thing's going to be in a, 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 an incredible place of torment. Hell. And if I really believed in hell, you know, some of you, uh, Frank, you talk about Vietnam on, on Tuesday night. You know, that's just a taste of hell. Hell's going to be a place you can't come back from. You're not going to get to come back. Amen. You're going to wish for a drop of water, just a little bit of water. It's going to be an eternal. And you say, well, Pastor, are you sure? It's I, I'm pretty sure it's eternal. But what if it's only for a year? And you ain't, get, you ain't going to make heaven after. What if it's a disintegration of a body? See, I, I believe hell is eternal because that's what I believe Scripture teaches. But on the bottom line, let me ask you this. If there was no hell, would you still serve Jesus knowing there's a heaven and our loved ones are there? And rows and rows of people in this church that I've done their funerals, I'm going to see them again. Amen? I, that's why Paul said, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I'm pressing. So if you go, I'm pressing on for something. Amen. There's something great. He wasn't, he wasn't so much about I want to leave hell, I want to gain heaven. But by the way, when I got born again, when I got saved, it was because of hell. I was scared to go to hell. I'd heard hell, hell is a forgotten place for forgotten people. You got family in hell. You got old friends in hell. Forgotten people who forgot. What did they forget? That there's ever a hell to start with, and they live like it. You've heard the old phrase, living like hell. You have, hadn't you? If you hadn't, you just did. And that's what a lot of folk do. They live like they ain't no hell. So evangelism, to me, I had to answer that question when I was in college. You know why I support missions? You know why we, we support my, my daughter who's in Romania right now? Missions in Mexico right now? Missions in Ecuador right now? Why do we support missions? Because we believe that they're reaching people that we can't reach. Amen. So we got to send them. We got to send them. Evangelism is that important. Matthew 28. I want to skip down to verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. And surely I'm with you always to the very end. He commanded. It wasn't a suggestion. It was a command. God's not willing that any should perish. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God's patient. Hupomene is the Greek word. He's patient. He's enduring us. Amen. That everybody comes to repentance. The issue we got to settle, do those who do not know Jesus, are they lost? There would be no need for Jesus to come and die if we believed that there was no hell to shun or heaven to gain. The Scripture tells us to value, to seek, to win the lost. Luke 15 said there was a lost coin that needed to be found. There was a lost sheep that needed to be found. There was a lost son, a prodigal son. And I mentioned to you that in my life I have prodigals. I have people that I love. You know, I'm getting a box, I'm putting a coat in it, I'm putting shoes in it, I'm getting a ring in it, and I'm believing God that one day the prodigal will come home. Amen. I, and I got other people in the church doing the same thing for their prodigals and believing God for them to come home. They're lost. We've got to get them back. The church has to provide something that the people cannot get somewhere else. There's nowhere else you get salvation, relationship through fellowship, acceptance, releasing of worship, discovery of purpose comfort and sorrow, where else would you turn to the house of God? Healthy growth is from a healthy church. We want quality, don't we? We want quality people. We want people that's got things going for them in their life. We, we want to see that happen. Amen. That's what healthy churches have. Amen. They share their faith. They're grounded in the Word. They're, they're elders and sister elders, even if you would, they use their talent in ministry. They mature into the Christ-like image. But can I tell you something else? We also want quantity. Somebody say, well, they're all about the numbers. It's according to what you're counting. It's according to what you're counting. Yeah, we want numbers. We want
want to see God magnify, magnify and multiply people here. It refers to the number of disciples at church. It said 3,000 was added. If 3,000 didn't matter, it just said a whole lot of folk got saved. But it counted 3,000. Later they said 5,000 got saved. Amen. They pulled fish up on the, on the shore. Jesus had the nets full. When he pulled them up, they counted them 200, I think 249 fish. Men were saved in the book of Acts, chapter 28. They came to shore. How many men? 276 men. Why did they count the men? Because they mattered. People matter. If you've got three kids and you're out on a hunting excursion and you lose two of them, but you got to keep Joe. You bring Joe home. You say, well, at least I got a really good quality child now. Wouldn't you send a search party out to get the other two? Well, no, they really don't matter. I got Joe. As long as I got Joe, I'm good. But, you know, Larry and, and Curly, I don't want them back. No, we, we, got, we got to go after them. Can I get an amen? Amen. It refers to numbers of disciples in the church. Hallelujah. They do count. Marriage is healed. Count. People restored. Count. Redeemed lives. Count. Mobilized saints. Count. So what are we going to do about it, Pastor? Well, we're going to pray. We're going to give. We're going to fast. Amen. Travis, can I have you and Justin come up here and help me out real quick? The Scripture says in the book of Matthew, when you give, now I'm going to skip down to verse 5. When you pray. Now I want to skip down to verse 16. When you fast. When you fast. See, it tells us not if you pray, not if you give, but when. And when you fast. Go ahead and just start passing them out. If you would like a little oil, Go ahead and take one of these. You might still have some from last year. Just go ahead and take one, and I'll read this to you while you're taking it, and you'll understand why you're getting it. Do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to throw men, to show men they are fasting. I tell you the truth. They have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen and your Father who sees what is done in secret. Give me one of them, brother man. One of them who is seen, your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. It was asked of me in the midweek service, Pastor, how does the oil work? The oil is for consecration. It's always used as consecration in the Word of God, but it also has to do with the thought that, in my mind, I don't always understand the why certain things work. I don't understand how a plane stays in the sky. It blows my mind, aerodynamics. It blows my mind, uh, uh, an aspirin, take care of a headache, but it works. I don't know why the Bible says, call forth the elders and anointing with oil can heal somebody, but it works. I know this. The Bible says for you to anoint your head and for you to wash your face. For you to appear that you're not, you don't look like you're fasting. Now, Pastor, what's fasting? The Hebrew word for fasting means to cover the mouth. Let me just say this. You can actually fast cursing this month. Wouldn't that be a joy? For that child to walk in and look at Daddy and say, what happened to Mama? Normally, when she throws a flip-flop, there's something attached to it. But she didn't say a word. She's fasting. Your mama's fasting, cussing this month, son. But she ain't fasting, whooping your butt. All right? You follow me? So that it's to abstain. The Greek word for fasting simply means to abstain. So what is it this month over the next 21 days you'd like to abstain from? And it's a corporate fast. Now, you say, well, we're not supposed to tell anybody what we're doing. Well, we're all doing it together. So it's corporate. It's like Nineveh. Nineveh fasted when, when Jonah told him to fast, and God spared the city. Nineveh forced the animals to stop eating. They put everybody on a fast. Now, it's not a diet. It's a fast. Will you lose weight? I hope you do. But on the flip side, it's to help get yourself in control. Amen. It's to give yourself more to God. So two types of fasting. There's a full fast. Jesus did for 40 days. He had water. He had water. Listen to me. He drank water. You've got to drink lots of water. 
lots of fluid, but he ate no food. It's an extended period without food. You may decide one day, two days, three days, you may want to take some days off from eating. I can't do that. You can. But the doctor said, was he a Google doctor? The doctor said, so listen, everybody can, you, when you get sick, you fast. Your body will shut down on you whether you like it or not. It shut, then there's a partial fast. That's Daniel and the three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They had vegetable and water. In other words, it's soup. A lot of times, uh, my family do soup, salad, and cereal. It's just easy. It's easier for me to know what I am eating than what I'm not eating. Amen. So I have to decide what it is. So I may abstain from, you know, uh, you can nicotine, caffeine, cocaine, you know. Just kind of set it aside for 21 days, see what the Lord do. Can I get an amen? Amen. Glad y'all still with me. Isaiah said, Is this not the kind of fasting I've chosen? To loose the chains of injustice, untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke. Is it not to share your food with the hungry? You'll have more money when you fast it. You'll be able to share with other people. And to provide the poor wander with shelter. Then you see the naked, you clothe them, and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. May God put your family back together this next 21 days. And your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear, and your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help. And he will say, here am I. If you do not turn away, Isaiah 58, if you do, if, if you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing of the finger, the malicious talk. In other words, watch your language. While you, when you start fasting, you, you can get a little irritable. You know, you need a snicker. And I will tell you this, if you can't, if you can't deal with it, eat a snicker. I don't want you hurting people while you're fasting. So let's all take a little bit of oil. believe it takes a lot, but I do believe that it's important to anoint yourself, you know, and, and to take this all throughout the month, and when you start feeling a little tired, a little weak, uh, maybe you want, you know, I, I, I anoint cars, I drive people's cars, I anoint dashes, and ask God to protect me, uh, they're Harleys, they're hor I've anointed about everything, I actually went over one time, anointed a rabbit that it would breed, that's a true story. I've done so much for so many people, and I feel so foolish at 61 now. I should have never done that. That rabbit didn't need no help. Amen to the anointing. Father, in the name of Jesus, we anoint ourselves. We thank you for the ability to just set aside some time to abstain, to watch our mouth, to decide what we will eat, what we won't eat, what we will watch, what we won't, won't watch, what we will drink, what we don't drink. God, to give us the ability to have more time to study and to pray and to read your word, to consecrate ourselves and say to ourselves, we may be believers now, but we're learning to be disciples. God bless the ministries of this house and the word of the Lord in Jesus' name. And again, amen. Amen. As our servant leaders come, I knew I was going to go a long time today. I was short last week, so take that. envelope in front of you. Hold on, Joe. Well, I got to say this. Oh. Got to say it. You got to fast at last. You got to pray to stay. You got to give to live. You got to read to lead. You got to walk to walk. You got to talk to talk. You got to fly real high. And if you can't hack it, then grab your jacket. That's it. That's all I'm saying. Lord, bless the giving of your people. Pastor Joseph, would you mind coming up and make these announcements here? Because some of them pertain to you, sir. Y'all give Pastor Joseph a hand as he comes.